The text is Hebrews 11, and reading at verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac, your seed shall be called. He did so concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. So he offered up Isaac, concluding in verse 19, he did so. He did that offering, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense, as it is in the King James Version, in a parable. He received him back from the dead in a parable or in a figurative sense. Now, when we looked at the passage last week, I mentioned at the beginning that it is, of course, a famous incident from the life of Abraham and indeed from the Bible itself. And I mentioned to you that it can be seen in two ways. It should be seen in two ways. And I think it's better if we keep these two ways distinct. The first way to see it is definitely the obvious one, and that is as a, a trial and a severe trial of Abraham's faith. And uh, we saw it last week from that perspective. And the point of the trial there is not just to see uh, whether God was first in Abraham's life, whether God even was more important to him than his son, his only son, and the son whom he loved. But the trial touched on very important aspects of his faith and understanding. Does Abraham really believe in God? Does he really believe in the promises of God for the future? Does Abraham believe in the resurrection of the dead? Does Abraham believe that Isaac will be brought back from the dead? All these things were being put to the test in the particular test that God gave him. And as we saw last Lord's Day, Abraham passed that test. And as Hebrews tells us, he offered up his son. Although the knife never touched Isaac, God considered it done because it was done in Abraham's heart. And as I said last week too, it's important to remember that at no point did Abraham expect God to intervene in the proceedings in the way in which God actually did. That would be to reduce the whole thing to theater and to a kind of charade. Not at all. Abraham expected to do the deed and believed that at some point God would raise up Isaac and fulfill what he said he would fulfill through him. So Abraham offered him up. Now, God always honors faith and obedience. You can be sure of that. God always honors faith and obedience. And the greater the trial, the greater the reward. And here, the reward that God gives Abraham is the best reward of all for God's people. He simply brings the Lord Jesus Christ closer to him than he's ever brought him before. He makes the things of Christ clearer to Abraham's mind, and he brings them home to his heart in greater power as well. And I've no doubt at all that Abraham leaves Mount Moriah far richer and wiser in spiritual things than he was going to Mount Moriah. And uh, the trial was difficult, and he endured it for three days, but for the rest of his life, which was a considerable length of time, he would forever bless God for the trial he passed through because of what it brought to him, clearer views of Christ, 
and greater power to his heart. And uh, sometimes, you know, people can pass through very severe trials and uh, give thanks for them. I still remember many years ago a deacon in the Stornoway congregation when I was there. He was quite an old man at that time, but he had passed through a lot with stomach cancer and had the vast majority of his stomach removed with cancer. And uh, I remember speaking to him and he said to me, he said, I don't say this lightly at all. He says, because I've been through a lot. But he said, I would go through it again for what I got from God in that experience. And he was a good man and a wise man. He didn't say that flippantly. He meant it. He said, I would go through all that again for what I got from God in that experience. And I'm quite sure that Abraham would say the same thing. And that really is taking us to the second way in which we should view this incident. It's not just a severe trial of Abraham's faith, but it is actually a vivid prophecy, an enacted prophecy of Christ's person and his work. And it's not just a prophecy that we are to understand by looking back on it and interpreting it in the light of New Testament revelation. Not at all. It is a vivid prophecy of Christ's person and work that was seen by Abraham and understood by Abraham at the time to be a vivid prophecy of Christ's person and work. After all, if it wasn't seen and understood by Abraham at the time as such, it wouldn't really have been a blessing to Abraham. It would have been a blessing to us. But it was for Abraham. It was for Abraham. And perhaps the best way to understand this is to fast forward 2,000 years from this particular point to the encounter between Christ and the Pharisees uh, that we read in John chapter 8. I don't mean you to turn to it. You don't really need to. But as you'll remember, the Pharisees were putting forward their proud boast that they were children of Abraham. And because they were children of Abraham, they were children of God. And uh, they were entitled to heaven. Christ says to them, of course, if you were really the children of Abraham, you would be like Abraham himself. But he says you are far more like the devil whose children you really are. And he says to them, if you were really like Abraham, you would rejoice to see my day. Now, this is where it begins to get important. And you notice this word see, because in a minute we're going to focus on its importance. You would rejoice to see my day. Because he said 2,000 years ago, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And what's more, he saw it, and he was glad. Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and was glad. Now, <clears throat> as I understand it, Christ is saying something general and something specific about Abraham's faith here. First of all, he's saying something general, that Abraham rejoiced to see my day. When I say that's general, what I, what I mean by that is that that describes Abraham's life of faith generally. It describes the substance of his faith. If you were going to ask Abraham, in other words, who is it that you believe in? What forms the, the real core and content of your faith? He would say, well... I live by faith in God, and particularly the promise that God is going to send a deliverer to this world who will undo the effects of the curse, so much so that one day there shall be a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness will dwell. And in the meantime, between now and then, every single soul that believes that promise will be renewed by the power of that special gift of a Messiah or the Deliverer who will come into this world. So I live to see that day. Uh, I live in the sense of 
knowing that that day will come and I rejoice in it and I am glad in it. In other words, the day of Christ to come was what gladdened his heart and enthused his soul. And we really need to understand that. I'll come back to it a little later on, but right the way down from the fall when God made the first promise to Adam, which will come to very shortly, the whole of the believing world waited for God's deliverer to come, rejoicing to see that day, believing it would come, and believing that it cast its blessing right back even to the day in which they themselves lived. So he was constantly seeing that day of Christ, day by day, by faith. But then Jesus says something different. Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Now, I think the only way in which to make real sense of that is to say that there is some kind of distinction between that and the general rejoicing that he had seeing Christ's day. In other words, he's referring to some definite incident or a specific incident, or maybe even more than one, when the day of Christ became especially real to Abraham. And if you think of it, there are three occasions on which that happened in Abraham's life. The first was in the birth of Isaac. From his own dead body, virtually, and from what was virtually the dead body of Sarah, his wife, God produced a son, a living child from a couple who were dead. In the birth of that son, God sees Sorry, Abraham sees the day of Christ. The second incident is his famous meeting with Melchizedek, the king of Jerusalem. That king, you'll remember, was a priestly king. And when Abraham met him, he seems full of awe. And he bows down before him and he gives him a tithe of all that he possesses. And Abraham was a fantastically wealthy man, but there and then he gave him a tenth of all that he possessed because he, he saw in this priest king of Jerusalem, mysterious Melchizedek, he saw the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the second occasion on which he clearly saw the day of Christ. The third, and I've no doubt the most important, is this one here, on Mount Moriah, where he sees most plainly what God is going to do for him and for all who believe in sending a deliverer into this world. On Mount Moriah, Abraham sees the day of Christ, and he is glad. Let me take the word see with you for a little while. Abraham rejoiced to see my day. This idea of seeing is very prominent in Genesis 22. We have it actually translated for us as provide. The word provide and the word see are the same in Hebrew. Now, languages are strange things. You, you sometimes have the same word meaning Two very different things, and you wonder how that can be. For example, if I said, I'm going up to the bank, that would mean a different thing if I was standing in a river or standing in the middle of the high street. But the word see and provide are more closely related than you'd think, because even in English, we actually relate the two things. For example, see to it. In other words, if I want something done or something provided, I might say to the person, you see to it. Now, what does the word see got to do with that? But you'll notice how it's connected with provision. You see to it. That's exactly the link that you have in Hebrew between seeing and providing. For example, when Abraham says to his son, you know, Isaac says, where is the lamb? We've got the wood and the fire, but where is the lamb? Abraham responds literally, God will see to it for himself. 
That's how he, he uses the word see. It's translated here as provide. Abraham will provide a lamb for himself, and that's fine. In verse 14, we have the same thing. When the whole transaction is over, and Abraham looks at it spiritually, having received the blessing, Abraham gives a new name to that place, Moriah. He gives a new name to that mountain, and he calls it, the Lord will provide. You'll remember in the King James Version, that was left untranslated. Jehovah Jireh, which of course has come down to us through the ages. And if I was going to ask you, let's say you knew your Bible quite well, and I was going to say to you, what does Jehovah Jireh mean? You would probably say the Lord provides, and you'd be right. But the King James goes on in an interesting way, because it says that he called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh, because in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. The King James suddenly switches from provision to seeing. There's nothing wrong with that. And very often disputes about translation are because people don't really understand the reason for these things. There's a reason why you can switch these things. The provision is being seen. God is seeing to it. And by seeing to it, he is providing. So the reality is that God is providing. He is providing a lamb for himself. He is making a provision in Mount Moriah, and the provision that is made on Mount Moriah is a provision that is to be seen, seen by Abraham, and seen by you, and seen by me. Today, I hope as we look at this mountain and at this great incident, that we will see the Lord's provision. And, um, of course, the writer in Genesis says that, as it is said to this day, in verse 14, Let's uh, read the verse again. Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day. And the writer here is Moses, so he's writing about his own day. In the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Ah, uh, yes, friends, there was a provision made that day, but there was a provision still to be made in that very place for you and for me. So let's look at God's provision on this mountain, as Abraham saw it. And in the first place, we can say that in the Mount of the Lord, Abraham saw a father's provision. Ah, yes. However, we're to understand of salvation and the coming of the Messiah into this world. The giver is a father. It's the provision of a father. A father who provides his own son. And Abraham sees that very, very clearly. He knows from now on, most certainly, that the Messiah coming into this world will be the son of God. And how great a gift that is. It is, of course, contained in the text that's one of the, if not the best known text in the Bible, that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Notice the onlyness, the begottenness of that son, his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He gave his son, his only son, and his only son whom he loved. And of course, God loved him with a greater love than Abraham loved Isaac. An infinitely greater love. And because that gift is so great, the cost of giving it is greater too. As Paul says in the letter to the Romans, he spared not his own son. You would think God would. You would think whatever he would be prepared to give, he would not be prepared to give his own son but he spared not his own son. It is, of course, harder to give your son as a sacrifice than to give yourself. I've often had this asked of me, you know, why did God not give himself but give his own son? Well, I suppose there are a couple of ways of answering that. Uh, one of them I've 
often used, and it refers to the days of the Troubles in Ireland, where somebody was being chased by the uh, IRA at the time. And uh, although he feared for his life, he was quite able to live with it until his phone went one day and the person on the other end of the line simply gave his son's address. And from that point, he felt he couldn't stand anymore. It is one thing to see himself in danger. It was another thing to think of his son in danger. You see, you see the point there, that your son is more precious to you, in a sense, than you are to yourself. And there's a way, I was thinking of this recently, there's a way in which we have to think of the father's gift of his son in connection with the son's willingness to come. I don't think it's ever right to separate these two things. It's not as though the father takes somebody who's absolutely external to himself and offers him, uh, rather than offering himself. There's a way in which the willingness of the son comes into it. Uh, let me try to explain that using another illustration that I came across quite a while ago, and I can't remember which book it was in. I have a feeling it was in Richard Wormbrand's book, uh, where he details his sufferings uh, uh, during the reign of communism. But he speaks of a past. If it was him, he speaks of a pastor. It was a pastor anyway, who was being tortured for the faith. And of course, he, pressure was being put on him to deny the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that was difficult to bear, but he was enduring the torture and the pain. And one day they brought his son in, he was 15 years of age, and they began to torture him in front of him. And then asked him to recant. And of course, the poor man was in extremity. Um, but there was a, a strange intervention because the son unexpectedly turned to his father and said that if, if you deny our Savior, you are not the father I thought you were. And that strengthened his son, strengthened his father, I should say. The son was put to death. The son was put to death. But you'll notice how the willingness of the son is to be seen along with the sacrifice of the father. You'll notice how the two things go together there. Now, the analogy is not perfect but there is most certainly a comparison and a real connection. The father gives a son who, because of the mystery of the Trinity, are so intertwined as to, in a sense, be one anyway. But the giving of the son is not to be considered apart from the willingness of the son to be that sacrificial gift. But even considering that willingness to be there, it is still the case that the father spared not his own son. Could have, but he did not, because he desired the salvation of those whom he loved with an everlasting love. And no greater gift than that could be conceived of. So in the mount of the Lord, a father's provision is seen. It is the Father who provides. The second thing to be seen on the Mount of the Lord is the provision of a son or the son's provision. After all, Christ does not just speak of himself as being given by the Father, but he speaks of himself as giving himself. Giving himself, as he says in one place, a ransom for many. And does that not become clear to Abraham in the person of Isaac? Yes, I think it does. The role of Isaac in this sacrifice is often overlooked and understandably so, because the great emphasis is laid, of course, on Abraham and his faith. But as I mentioned last week, Abraham is a youth at this point, at least 15 years of age, and he's more than a match for his father in strength, in all probability. Certainly, he can easily outrun his father, and that's all it would take in the loneliness of Mount Moriah. Or if the worst came to the worst, he has the power to resist. But friends, there's no trace of that 
no trace of it anywhere. And had it happened, had it happened, it would have been recorded for us. But it's not recorded because such a thing never happened. As the last leg of the journey approaches, we're told that Isaac took the wood that the servants had been carrying and laid it on Isaac's back. I think the understanding is that Abraham is himself not able to take it. But there's a type to be fulfilled. And fulfilled it must be. And Isaac carries this wood to the place of his own death. And at some point, Isaac is made perfectly aware of what's about to happen. Especially regarding his own role. And there's no doubt that when his father begins to bind him, Isaac understands it. But Isaac lets it be. He allows himself to be bound. And of course, his father lays him on the altar that he's just built. And again, whatever questions Isaac has, and he has many, and whatever fears Isaac possesses, and he has many, be silent. Silent like a lamb led to the slaughter. Or as a sheep before its shearers is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. Earlier on the journey he had said, my father, here is the fire and here is the wood, but where is the lamb? But on this point he says nothing at all. He knows he is to be offered up, and in that respect, he trusts his father. He had trusted his father for 17-odd years, and he trusts his father still. There are times when our trust of our own father is put to, te to the test. Do we, as I said last week, really believe God? Do we still believe what he promises us? Are we still, in, still willing to do what he asks of us? Here it is true in connection with Ab Abraham, his father. Is Isaac willing to still trust and to still believe his father, even when he begins to bind him for a sacrifice? Well, he does. This is his father's will. And so, of course, it is with the Messiah himself. As Christ is born into the world and as he grows up, as he reads the scripture, and is taught the scripture, as his pure young mind begins to understand, he sees himself as the victim. He knows, even from his childhood, not just that he must be about his father's business, but he knows that that involves an awful sacrificial death. It is the father's will for him to lay down his life and to endure the pain of a broken law, and it's his call to acquiesce in it, and acquiesce he does. He carries his own wood to Calvary, and on the very same hill, I believe, where Abraham offered this boy, I'll come to that in a second, he offers himself. Not just a father's provision, but a son's provision. So in the Lord's Mount, we see in Abraham, you could say a father's provision, and in Isaac, we see a son's provision. And again, in the mountain, we see a substitutionary provision, because a remarkable thing happens. Suddenly, Isaac is off the altar, and there is a ram placed on it. And the parable at this point, which Hebrews refers to, receiving a son back in a parable, the parable becomes a little more complex at this point, rather than being simple and straightforward. For us to be delivered, somebody else must die. And here's where we need to take Isaac and the ram, as it were, together. Let's look at the ram first of all, because mysteriously, when God arrests the proceedings and tells Abraham not to touch his son. Abraham turns and looks here again. He looks and he sees. He sees a provision. He sees a provision. The provision is a ram caught by its horns 
in a thicket. It too is Christ. I remember being asked once, why is it a ram and not a lamb? You would expect it to be a lamb. After all, the the chapter says, I mean, um, Abraham says earlier to his son that God will provide a lamb for himself. But to think of it as a ram is It doesn't mean that it's not a lamb. The emphasis there is on the fact that it's male. That's all. A lamb is the term usually used of a sheep until it's a year old. After a year old, it's referred to as either a ewe or a ram. And of course, its meat is very different in the the first year and and what it is beyond that. So so this is a male lamb. That's the point being made here. Just like at the Passover, when the lamb was being offered, it had to be a male of a year old. Well, here I would assume it was about a year old too, but it's specified as being a ram. It is a male. The year is the time when it reaches perfection. It's it's when it's at its fullness of strength. Uh, there's a type in that too, because the Lord was offered in the prime of his life. If you were to, if you were to ask, what is the prime of life when physical and mental attributes are at their strongest in comparison or taking a balance of each other, most people would go for something around 30 or the early 30s. I think I've mentioned to you before, it's a strange thing, for example, with sportsmen, usually. You often find in football, for example, that in the early 30s, so on, they, they just begin to taper off because they're, they're not quite the same. Not quite the same. At 30, life is still before you, but sufficient has gone behind Um, you're strong in understanding, strong in ability, strong in desire. That's the point at which the Lord was tempted as to whether he wanted the world on the devil's terms or the world on God's terms. It's the point at which he's put to death, the point at which he could choose any alternative that he so wished to choose, but chose God and suffering and death for his love for his own people. The ram here, represents the Savior as certainly as Isaac did. It's a complex figure. One needs to take the place of the other because Isaac isn't going to die, but the ram will die. Because at that point, the ram is representing the Lord Jesus Christ. The ram is caught in the thicket. Is there a meaning to that? It's an awful question to ask because sometimes things are there just because they have to be there. I mean, the ram has to be caught somehow or other. Does the thicket have meaning? Well, I think, friends, in an incident like this, where the whole is full of meaning, we have to see the whole thing as an enacted parable. And it's very difficult to leave the thicket out of that. The thicket is a thicket of thorns. It's a thicket of thorns. And that surely represents something in the light of Scripture itself. There have been some uh, interpreters of scripture down throughout history who have understood the lamb caught in the thicket or the ram caught in the thicket as a a picture of Christ being set apart in the counsel of God, that in a sense he is fixed there. Now, while it's true that Christ was fixed there, after all, the Bible tells us that he was set aside as the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, Still, that doesn't really explain the thicket. It doesn't give the thicket a proper meaning. The thicket has to mean something, not something arbitrary, but something that we can actually relate it to. Surely, surely the key lies in the thorn itself. We can't think of thorns now without thinking of curses. We'll see it shortly in Genesis 3, but... From the, from the day Adam sinned and, cur- and, and a curse was pronounced upon him, the curse, of course, came onto the earth and it took the forms of thorns and thistles. Life would be a toil and a labor. And the thorn represents curse. That's one of the reasons why the Lord Jesus Christ was crowned with a crown of thorns. The Romans had their own intention in doing so when they wove these crowns together, these thorns together, and pulled it down over his head, leaving blood and pain 
It's interesting that when they took off his clothing and they put a royal robe on him, just in order to to laugh at him and to mock him, they put off that royal robe and, and put his own robe back on him. But they never removed the crown. He, he went to the cross with the crown of thorns wearing them. And there as he hung upon the tree in the same place where Isaac was here sacrificed, there was a sign on his head that he was carrying the curse. He, he became a curse and he carried the curse to deal with a curse. There was no other way of dealing with a curse but by bearing it and carrying it. And the thorn surely represents that here. The ram is entangled because he is entangled in our sins. He is set aside as a lamb slain from the foundation of the world because of our sins. That's what entangles him. I've seen it um, suggested too, and I wouldn't discount this at all. It might be a part of it that you would expect a ram normally to be entangled by, by his wool, by his body. And uh, some writer, and I can't remember who it was, wondered if the reason that he was entangled by his horns was to do with the cleanliness of the sacrificial victim, because there was always an emphasis in sacrifices in the Old Testament on the, on the victim being pure. The lamb had to be without spot and it had to be without blemish. And therefore, it was only entangled by its horns with its body left pure. I, I wouldn't say there was nothing in that. But I would say that the emphasis lies on the fact that it's our sins that have ensnared him. Our sins and his obligation to deal with these sins. So there is a savior provided for sinners. Substitute. At this point, Isaac becomes just a sinner. One moment he is representing the Savior, here he is simply a man. Just as you, a man or a woman, are a sinner in need of salvation. And when the knife should enter you, lo and behold, here is a ram in the thickets. You step off the altar and he takes your place. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And the Lord laid down his life for you. What more could he do than that? And again, in the Mount of the Lord, we don't just see a substitutionary provision, but an effective provision. Because with the Lamb, Isaac is released. In the drama here as it's enacted, Isaac is released before the Lamb is slain. In our spiritual understanding of it, the ram is slain and Isaac is released. The letter to the Hebrews says that Abraham received him from the dead in a parable. He received him from the dead in a parable. In other words, when Isaac steps off that altar, Abraham sees resurrection. That's what he sees, resurrection. He sees it in a twofold sense. He sees it, first of all, as the resurrection of the Savior. Because for him, it was the Savior who lay there. And it is the Savior who is now rising. This, of course, means that you need to separate the ram. Just follow that in your own head. A Christ dying as a substitute and a Christ rising again. He gets him back from the dead in a parable. In his mind, Isaac was dead. And now in his mind, Isaac is alive again. So he knows that the Savior God is providing, his own son, will be one who will lay down his life for sinners. Well, he should have understood that anyway. And he did know that anyway, because every single sacrifice that had ever been offered in faith was in the belief that the Messiah that would one day come into this world was one who would die as a substitution for us. And he sees that plainly. He sees him laying down his life and he sees him taking it up again. But not just the Savior. No. Abraham sees the resurrection of Isaac and he sees his own resurrection. 
and your resurrection and mine. And he sees that resurrection in the most comprehensive sense possible. Because he sees here a dying people brought to spiritual life and conversion. And he sees a people who die at the end of their days brought back into life, body and soul in the great day of the last and general resurrection. He sees all that. On that wonderful day when we are raised into the likeness at last of our Lord Jesus Christ which is what we long for in this life. And the longer we live in this life, the more we long for it in this life. It's even a sign of your Christian faith that you long to be like him, free of sin as a thing and free of its consequences. And at last, like the Lord, he sees that too. A substitutionary death and a resurrection. All that. Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide a provision by a father of his own son, a provision from his own son of himself, and a provision that shall be seen to all the ends of the earth. You know, when Paul was writing to the Romans, he, he speaks of Christ crucified as the one whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, declaring his righteousness. The one whom God has set forth. The Greek word behind that means really publicly displayed. I've said to you very often before that if you took the landmass of the earth and pushed it together as it originally was, you have the holy land in its center. And there you have a hill. And raised up on a hill, you have a cross. And from that cross, there is a public display of God's provision to the whole world. It's just like a beacon there. It's not visible to everyone, in, except insofar as it is preached forth visibly or placarded by mouth to all the ends of the earth, a propitiation declaring God's righteousness. If you go to Jerusalem today, the golden dome, which of course shines so spectacularly in Jerusalem, is held to be, by the Muslims, the very place where Abraham sacrificed Ishmael. I'm prone to slips of the tongue, very conscious of that. That wasn't one, because the Muslims do believe that Abraham was going to sacrifice Ishmael, not Isaac. And for them, the golden dome locates the spot where they believe that took place. Well, the interesting thing is that, as in so many other things, they're near the truth, but they're off it. The fact of the matter is that we don't know exactly, really, where the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. There are a couple of competing sites where people think it likely. I don't know which one it is. But I do know that were you to locate it, you would also locate this very spot on which Abraham offered his son. Because that is Moriah. That is where Jerusalem is. And on the Mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. Jehovah Jireh, the provision of God, shall be seen. And I suppose for you, last of all, uh, the question is whether you see that provision yourself today. Um, I was thinking recently on this, and I was wondering how different, let me close with this really, how different the return journey from Moriah was to the, to the journey there. How different. I remarked that on the way to Moriah, Abraham had much to think on, but little to say. But on the journey back, how, how much more he's got to think on. And how much more he's got to say. And in fact, on the journey back, Isaac can share in it. And there's not enough time for them both to think on what had just happened and what it meant to them both. Words are just not enough. Like he went out the way he went out and he came back the way he came back. That's what, that's what God does. He, he doesn't put us through a trial for the fun of it. There's a reason for it. And if we learn to endure the trial in faith, we'll come back with a full cup. 
You could, couldn't stop them speaking on the way back from Mariah. Not a word out, but not enough words on the way coming back. The question is, can you look to Mount Moriah today and see God's provision there? Christ is lifted up before you often, but have you ever looked? Have you ever seen a provision there for you, a sinner? Let's close by uh, singing to the praise of God. We'll sing from the same psalm that we sang from last, Psalm 89, page 346. Three, four, five, sorry, that should be, and we're singing to the tune Effingham. Thou hast an arm that's full of power, thy hand is great in might, and thy right hand exceedingly exalted is in height. Now, remember, the right hand is the hand of power. It's exalted because God is working. So this is drawing attention to a, a God working on our behalf. Justice and judgment of thy throne are made the dwelling place. Now, we know that to be the case that God is fundamentally just. But lo and behold, here he comes towards us with mercy. Mercy accompanied with truth shall go before thy face. God is on a journey towards us. And those who hear him coming are greatly blessed. Oh, greatly blessed the people are, the joyful sound that know the sound of God's coming in mercy. In brightness of thy face, O Lord, they ever on shall go. They in thy name shall all the day rejoice exceedingly, and in thy righteousness shall they exalted be on high. 13 to 16, let's stand to sing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.